first question I have to get out of the way. I have read that Bon Jovi was originally, I guess, Bon Jovi. So can you explain <laughs> <laughs> when and why did that change? <laughs> <laughs> was I, the pronunciation was always the same. There was no Bon Jovi <laughs> unless you were on a Saturday Night Live skit. <laughs> but for phonetics uh, in in our culture, the GI proper spelling of the of the word and the name uh, reads as though it's a J. Yes. So um, when I got a record deal in 1983, um, I had gotten it under the guise of just being a solo. Act, but not really wanting to just be, you know, a solo act at creating a band. This was the compromise. Because I, I had gotten a record deal without the band and had written Run Away without the band and was on the radio in Chicago. You know, I was like, I was, on, I was getting national airplay with this song. So I put the band together uh, for what I thought would be three weeks. And it's been nearly 30 years. Okay. So, so growing up, I know you're, you're as associated with a state as anyone. So I want to ask you, growing up in New Jersey, just what sort of a, uh, a childhood did you have and did you always sort of have this interest in music then and assume that this is where you would end up or it was always this way? Well, there was such an innocence and there was a different time. You know, I was very young. Um, like I said, I've had a record deal for, for 30 years, so I was six years old at the time. <laughs> um, and in New Jersey in the late 70s, there was a, a place to nurture original material. So as soon as I was old enough to realize that the only way to, to make a career of this was to start playing your own stuff, I did, and I focused solely on that. So at the time, when you're 18, 19, 20, I didn't have a lot of financial responsibilities. I was able to still live at home. Um, I was ultra-focused on this, and truthfully, I didn't go to college, and in the environment I grew up, you either joined the service or you went to work in a number of factories in the area. Very few kids at the time when I graduated high school, in my high school, in my class, were thinking of careers beyond high school, you know, other than going to work or joining the service, which my three best friends did. And for me, it was always single-minded focus on music. And fortunately for me, like I said, when I was 21, I, I wrote Runaway and never looked back. Uh, as a kid, and, and I guess even as a, High school or adolescent, what were the kind? What kind of music did it for you? What was? What were your favorites? It was pretty diverse for a kid of that age, but the obvious things were whatever was popular at the time in the latter seventies. Be, you know, the rock and roll stuff that was on the radio, from Aerosmith to Led Zeppelin to Alice Cooper and Leonard Skinner. The obvious latter seventies rock and roll. Um, but I also enjoyed Motown, and I liked soul music, and I liked R and B stuff, and uh, those roots come from the Jersey Shore too. You know, a lot of uh, the guys that came before me, their uh, direct lineage ties back into soul music. And so that was my introduction to it. And in turn, you go back and you, you discover it. Interesting. And, and so, and the way you first dabbled in music was you had, you were part of various bands as a kid? Is sure, that, sure. So, uh, and, and was it always clear that you were going to be the, the singer or were you, were there other things that were equally as... No, I, I was, I was always the singer, yeah. It was almost forced upon me and um, I was learning how to play the guitar and somehow, you know, the microphone was there and um, I, I just gravitated toward it. Um, it, it. I loved it more than it loved me. <laughs> But eventually, I learned the craft and you know how to sing properly. And so with with Runaway, what you know, I guess that's everybody's dream. They have, yeah. others, you know, to have that kind of a break. What what led up to that? Was there a lot of uh, oh, struggle yeah. and fighting? Before sure. That or, yeah. But I was very young, so in the context of what it was, sure. But I was twenty one years old. Um, I had that single minded focus, realizing that you couldn't play other people's music and intend to have a career. So I quit my own cover band, and I joined a band as the singer in a guy's band. And that lasted a short period of time, but it helped me understand pop song structure. And that began the process, and then I went off and started writing on my own, and uh, became a gopher in a recording studio, and uh, you know was continuing to make demos at night, and getting guys to come and play little showcases whenever I could gather four or five guys that would be willing to work for no money. You know, original bands made no money. Um, and all the while trying to craft songs. And with that, 
you know, you just went out and, and from an opening act slot in a club between cover bands or a backyard barbecue or whatever built up. But what happened with me was um, I was frustrated because Runaway, one of the many songs I'd written and recorded by that point, got no response from any record company I'd send it to. But one day it hit me and I thought, who is the loneliest man in the record business? The DJ. Who knows better than a DJ? who at the time was very influential. DJs were really influential. They could make and break bands out of regions like Chicago, Philadelphia, uh, New York City. You know, the, there was possibilities on a much smaller scale, but with the voice of the DJ. Yeah. So I went to a brand new radio station um, in New York. It was called WAPP. It was so new that, thank the Lord, they didn't have a receptionist. And that is probably the key to my success. I was able to walk in and knock on the DJ's booth. Got one of those classic, you know, right out of the movies. <laughs> Wait till I it can come out. He talked to me, I talked to him. You know, we, we hung around long enough and, and, um, and he'd said, we're doing a homegrown record. Would you like to be a part of it? And I said, no, I have no interest in a singles deal on a homegrown record. My aspirations to make albums. Eventually I was talked into it. And fortunately for me, that homegrown record is what allowed the song to be played not kidding, in Chicago, in Tampa, in New York City. Suddenly those same A&R guys are looking through their desk, where's this, who is this? And, uh, and they started to call us and, and you know, my, my represent, representatives to, to sign me. And was it, there was never a point where you said, maybe let's go for this as a solo? career or you always wanted it to be with a band and, and then heartbeat they had that band that we've now I, I defined the word band yeah. you know clearly right from the yeah. right from the get-go um, but these guys all had other things lined up all had you know other avenues towards their own successes Tico was in a band that had a record deal he was married he's, he's 10 years older than I am Alec was in a very successful cover band that was making three thousand dollars a night, which in 1982 was a fortune, and more than we were going to make as an opening act. Richie had a, a, his own independent record out, and he was currently at the, what, currently at that time he was touring with Joe Cocker as an opening act. So, and at the height of Joe's commercial successes, so the, all the guys had things. And Dave quit and went back to college, and he was in my cover band when I was a kid. So what was supposed to be three weeks, we started to gel and we liked each other. And then, you know, when Richie came to see me play, um, I said, yeah, okay, I, I, I hear you, but I've heard a hundred great lead guitar players. It's going to be, can we write together? You know, do you like songwriting? Are we on the same page with songwriting? So it was going to dictate the way we played the guitars. Um, we hit it off immediately on that level. And, and unfortunately, you know, even the magic blend of our voices, which is pretty much, you know, the brand. Uh, when we sing together, people know it's us, yeah, you know. Uh, it's, and fortunately for me, they just believed the vision and through the ups and downs and the ups again, so they've been there. And so it was always going to be called Bon Jovi? Yeah, yeah, because yeah, at that time, remember, Runaway's on the radio, it's breaking nationally as John Bon Jovi. Yeah. So what was I going to change it to the, the golf bags, you know, it wasn't... <laughs> It wasn't gonna fly. So for the band collectively, was it slippery when wet? That was the that was the break out. You know, again, you know, when I'm keeping it in context, you think Runaway on a homegrown record is the big time. You yeah, think yeah, opening yeah. act, getting a record deal uh, on Polygram Records, you thought was the big time. Yeah. So that first album, we thought we did make it. The second album, now is a little more successful. Yeah, yeah. Now slippery when wet is, you know, it, it's forget about it. It's it's hitting the 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 top of the mountain, you know, at full speed. It, it was our Like a Virgin thriller, you know, it was that record for us. And, uh, and, and we just, you know, hit that rocket ship to fame at that time. Uh, yeah, it was, that was the phenomenon. So this is, this is maybe an unfair thing to ask in a relatively brief amount of time, but I just wonder if I could fire a couple of create, just creative questions at you. And one, sure. you know, generally, what sorts of things have, have inspired your music, uh, you know, are, are, do you find yourself going to the, is it, are there the same well in a way over and over, or are there always different things? I, I think that there should be different things, or else you're going to be repetitious, and if ever you fall into that trap, you, you know, you have to jar yourself to move on. Could I rewrite You Give Love a Bad Name? Not well, 
but I was 25 and you should write a song like that at, at that age and that time in your life and in that era. Um, I wouldn't want to write that now. And could I have written this forthcoming album then? No, I didn't have the chops for it. You know, or these songs or these movies. Or, so, but boy, if I couldn't 25 years later, then I'd be a fool. You know, if you don't learn your craft and learn it well in that amount of time, if you were a cobbler or a baker, you better learn to do it well in that. And where uh, physically do you, where does the creative stuff happen? Sometimes it's as simple as your kitchen table or the bedroom or, you know, just in your dreams you wake up and you scribble something and you come up with an idea. Um, but most times it's a process. You know, you, you have a title, you sit down, you start plunking away on the guitar and then, you know, you pick at it until Richie comes over and then you, you collaborate. Or if you do it by yourself, it could be over a period of uh, days. Sometimes it's minutes, sometimes it's weeks. You know, it's, it's never really the same. And have you found that, there, have you guys over the years developed a, a pattern at least of music before lyrics or vice versa or anything like that? I think we try to amass, let me use this record as an example, sure. a series of song titles so it may jar an emotion with the other guy. So at least we have to the small talk when you enter the room and you know that the idea is to write, the objective is to write a song today. Um, okay, what do we want to talk about? You know, after whatever's in the newspapers or what's going on in your life, you might reference a song title that you've got in your pocket. And, uh, and then, you okay, I like that, let's lock in. And uh, I guess when you're writing these, are you thinking of anybody in mind? First of all, when you're writing it, you know who, whose approval you would like to uh, seek, and then also, uh, is there somebody who, before you do uh, actually send it out to the world, who you do seek their, you know, their advice? Counsel. Yeah, counsel. Right. No, because that's usually it. It doesn't really it doesn't really work, you know. Um, one of the tr one of the, not the tricks that, that's a, that's a harsh word. One of the secrets uh, of our success is that the collaborative effort doesn't become my story or in that case Richie's story. It becomes our story, and in turn that make, may make it universal and timeless. So you're not typically talking about "Ooh, baby, baby, I love you." There will be some kind of value system within you know the song some of it has to be compromised because the other guy just can't wrap his arms around it but sometimes it's affirmation that it brings out or or deeper senses of loyalty or trust or distrust or fear but whatever the emotion it, it gets a little more universal and and uh an empowerment song like it's my life you know I mean, I had a fight so hard, like Frankie said, I did it my way. And he throws his hands up and just goes, what the hell are you talking about? And who's Frankie? I go, well, let me tell you. It's Sinatra. I had just come home from being a part of U571, the World War II movie. And I spent three months in Malta with these 12 guys. And I came home feeling pretty good. I'm thinking I'm going to be in a big movie. I'm going to make records when I want. I'm going to make movies when I want. Like Frank Sinatra said, the heck with everybody. And I, and I, but I could defend my position. Ultimately, he says, I don't get it. And I said, too bad, because I'm the one that's got to sing it. You know, and I won, I won the fight. But what happened was everybody in a, in a new generation decided they were Frankie. Their buddy was Frankie. You know, they knew someone that, that, that was going to be their Frankie. And you go, really? This, who knew? I mean, for me, it was Mr. Sinatra. Right. And, and, but that's the magic. You know, when something's so pure and you could fight for it, you'll find that people fight for it too. And, and I guess that to me begs the question that very few people in this world can answer, but you can. I mean, what does it feel like when you are out there in front of tens, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people that are repeating back to you or, mm. or even without you something that came out of your own head? What, how can, what goes through your, uh, your mind when something like, or and your heart, I guess, you know? Uh, that's, that answer's changed in, in the last 30 years. There was... You know, the first time you're driving in your car and you hear your song on the radio, you want to go fast and get pulled over so you can tell the cop, look, that's me. Uh, to, to a point where, you know, you would turn it off uh, because, uh, all right, enough already. Um, to then real true appreciation 
when you realize that it wasn't one or two or five or even ten albums, there was a body of work. And when you start talking about an honest to God body of work, then you realize how, you know, it's become a patchwork of American pop culture and you're pretty proud of it. There's there's a lot of people that have sung those songs for a lot of years. And uh, a lot of other bands. it's that and <laughs> karaoke on the king of karaoke <laughs> machines. <laughs> but um, you know, it's humbling. It's humbling. It's humbling. I, I think, you know, the dream for any kid that strums a tennis racket wants to be a rock and roll star. But once you get to that level, then you've got to deliver. And if you can deliver on a level where you've been around for a long, long time, and on the kind of level that we've been at, this isn't a nostalgia tour when you're on a Bon Jovi <laughs> tour. You know, so it, it's pretty wonderful. There's the other side of, of fame as well, though, which, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not here to tell you. I'm mean, just interesting to, to get your thoughts about the fact, you know, just even last night sitting across from you and your wife and watching how many times you are interrupted to the point where you can't even eat your dessert. And these are people that are industry insiders. <laughs> so I wonder when you're out in the real world, is there, you know, is it, does it always seem like it was worth it or is there a part of you that says, I'd kind of like to be, you know, uh, what I might have been if I never got into music, or just to have a, a little bit of privacy. Are you kidding? Um, no, but the truth of the matter is, Scott, um, I, I live a very, very normal life. I, I, it's a fallacy that you have the big entourage and that you live that kind of a lifestyle where you don't know what a gallon of milk costs. It, it just, it's not what made me. And maybe that's part of the success, success is that we never fell victim to that. Um, I stayed at home. I, I still have the first wife. I got, I got it right the first time. Right. And it's never going to change. What you saw last night was an exception because when you're in a situation where you're at a premiere, you know, you're, you're at an opening for something, people know that that's what you're there for and that's what they're there for. I get it. But trust me, uh, I'm, I'll be at my son's football game at 3 o'clock today and, you know, it's just the way it is. It's not a big deal. Is there, as you look back at the last 30 years, is there a constant theme or something that connects the beginning through the present, all the different music? I, I think that the, our core values have never changed. They were always optimism, uh, loyalty, truth, faith. Um, and and it, for a long time, that was a very lonely place to be because there wasn't a lot of other musicians that were writing about that kind of optimism. There was a real negativity for a decade. There was a lot of that kind of shoegazing and I hate the world and I don't want to grow up to be anything. And that, that was, we were on the outside then, you know, and I just always felt that there was an opportunity to lift people's hopes and dreams and aspirations because I came from that era. You know, I saw it personified here four years ago when a president was elected around those themes. It may seem to some naive or romantic, then so be it. You know, I saw a country come together over it. And uh, they just want to, you know, have a, a safe haven for their kids to grow up in and put food on their table. And they want to believe in something. They want to believe in themselves. And that brings me to something that has always been on my mind listening to your music. And, and throughout a number of songs, we hear about Tommy and Gina. And I just am curious, uh, you know, are these real people? Who are they? What is the... It seems to me that, in a way, they are that average guy and girl that you're talking about. But yep. I just want to let you, if you can explain it, such an interesting thing. Again, you know, it was a, uh, a collaboration. So, um, Tommy and Gina were born, you know, in, in a world of fiction, but based in truth. I, I, I remember my contribution to the song was that I wanted to start telling these stories, specific stories. Uh, you know, Richie had a different vision, and we co-wrote that song with a guy named Desmond Child, who's a dear friend of mine. And so we all contributed something different, and my uh, Tommy and Gina were, were different names and sort of to protect the innocent. But, you know, they had to make compromises at the time when I was 24, we wrote that, 25. Um, their lives were already going in a much, much different direction. Compromises had to be made and decisions were made and, and, and they were close friends of mine. So that subject matter was near and dear to me and I thought, wow, if, if I had to change direction because of these kind of decisions, what would happen to me? So I, I saw that struggle, you know, very close to me. I don't want to say firsthand because I was still pursuing my, my dreams, but um, I watched it 
you know, in the next lane. And, and anyhow, um, that's, a, a, again, a part of who we are, where we come from, why we do what we do. I, I just would not have fit into the L.A. strip scene. I, unf for good or bad, you know, we were lumped into a musical genre uh, because we were young and had long hair, and that's what the times were. I get it. But then and now, I always said I was never going to be 50 years old painting my nails black and writing bitch on my belly. <laughs> that's, a, that's a quote that I've been fortunate enough to say, see? You know, there was just so much more to, to life than yeah. that kind of a thing. And, and that peer group is what it is now. Um, but those people were, you know, I knew more about what those people were and what they were going through. And, what their dreams and hopes and aspirations and shortcomings were, and that's that's where we stayed. That may very well, as, as you kind of Im, Im, imply, uh, maybe a big part of why there has never really the interest in, in you guys has never really wavered very much over, since you started. Uh, but I wonder, for you, has the interest ever wavered? I mean, it's not easy, I would imagine, to be as prolific and and. Uh, not only in making music, but in going out and, and performing it and touring and being away from home and doing a lot. I know that you, you mentioned last night you have a bit of a, a schedule where it's, it's, you can make it work, but has it ever occurred to you, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe, it, maybe it's not worth it, maybe I'll take a break, or maybe, you know, or has it always been, let's keep going while we can? It's not driven by, for monetary reasons. Okay. It's not driven uh, for the commercial marketplace. But even when I got off the, 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 the road last um, August, it's been over a year, a month later, I just couldn't help myself. There was just, I, I was having a great time at home. I was, you know, doing everything I'd like to do. But I immediately delved into writing again. And, uh, and it was without Richie, I was going in a lot on my own and with our producer and, and doing stuff. While he was going to pursue a solo record, which was all part of the, please guys, go do your yeah. thing. And, David, of course, my keyboard player, went on to write um, Memphis, which four-time Tony Award-winning play, and that's now on the road, and he's developing another play. Tico needs to be home with his kid. Um, I just couldn't help it. So the writing process started to get so prolific that not only were, I, were we amassing songs for me, us, um, but then I started writing and... A, a, a Beach Boy opportunity came up to write the last song on the last Beach Boy record ever and uh, a couple of country covers and a girl from The Voice and all these covers and then this opportunity of course you know to be back into the movie songwriting business again um, it's been a, a re-energizing kind of a period for me so uh, it's it, but do you feel is it is it hard to to you know, on, on the one hand, just, you know, when you do do a tour, we're talking a lot of travel, a lot of, uh, uh, as, you, as you're saying, restaurants that, that get old after a while and all yeah. that. I mean, is it, it, it's still, is there, you think there will ever come a point where you say it's not worth the... the well, it's, it's always worth yeah. it. Yeah. But if you're, again, you know, if you learn how to do it, you can do it in a way where you're not physically drained. Yeah. In, in our youth, and I don't mean to sound old, but when we were really young, he would do 240 shows. Yeah. And they'd be back to back to back to back. And it almost killed us. So um, nowadays, 100 shows, 150 shows last tour would be this, you know, the extreme. Yeah. So it's, if you do it well, it's paced well, you can be on the top of your game, yeah. So it's been 22 years since you wrote a song for a movie. And in, the la in that case, it worked out pretty well with Blaze of Glory yeah. uh, to end up at number one on the Billboard, to end up with an Oscar nomination, Best Original Song, and the Golden Globe. So I guess that the question is, why, why 22 years until we get you again on a movie that the stand-up guys now? I think in a strange way, it's almost as though I'd forgotten that I did it the first <laughs> time. Um, fortunately, I've been so busy in that span, uh, primarily with band records. I've, I've only done one other solo project uh, between then and now. And um, we have been so fortunate to have been successful and enjoying each other's company yeah. that there's been no reason to be sequestered in a, in a room going back at it. So what happened um, was during this 
streak of my writing about a year ago. I had called my manager and I said, I've forgotten, but a long time ago I wrote this movie soundtrack. Do you have any great scripts out there? And he mentioned one called Stand Up Guys. And he said that uh, it hadn't begun shooting yet, but they had high hopes for the picture. And uh, he, he thought that thematically it was something that would uh, like an original song and that I could feel comfortable writing. And so he sent it to me anyhow. I, that was a Monday I called him. I received the script on a Tuesday. Wednesday I wrote it and Thursday he had it to play for the director and uh, Fisher Stevens and for Tom Rosenberg. And I sung it into my iPhone, literally on my acoustic guitar, imagining that people get it the way I get it and hear production. That was a bit of a leap because for the next six months they were like, we want it to sound like it did on that first recording. I go, I was slouched over my phone. I'm trying to make you a record now. But fortunately for me, the process of writing for movies, specifically for movies, I'm able to channel those characters. I'm able to take those words and make them my own. I'm able to even you know, grab a, a line or two so that you can see what on the screen came from the page, came through my pen, and I'm able to then relate it back to you in, in a song. Um, so I wrote the, the, what was the entitled track, Old Habits Die Hard. And the first line of the song is the first line of the movie, you look like shit. Which to me, as a songwriter, I'm immediately engaged. If you have a song in the first line of it says, you look like shit. I'm gonna go, I want to hear what this song is about. You know, it's obviously not a moon, June, and spoon rhyme scheme. You know, so <laughs> it, it, it fell off of my, my pen into the page, and, um, and I loved it, and you know, we loved it, and, and it's just so related to what these guys were. But when I was writing it, I, I admit that I thought um, Al's character was Chris's character, and Chris's was going to be Al's character, till I read into the script to realize in that scene in the Charger in the car, he yeah. said, I'm six two. you want yeah. leg room? I'm thinking, <laughs> Mr. Pacino's not six two. I guess it's the other way around. But that, I, I, I think it probably even made it a better song because, like I said, in our collaborative effort, the, the, the script I became a collaborator in, yeah. you know, because I wasn't stuck in... Mr. Pacino would only say this, Mr. Wilkin would only say this. Oh, I mixed them both up and made it me, you know? So anyhow, I, I wrote it. Everybody was excited about it. They were six, eight weeks out from even beginning to shoot the picture. Uh, I started hounding and pounding Tom Rosenberg. And music isn't the first thing they think about when they're right, you know, doing a drama and getting this caliber of actor and the financing and all together. So I guess I was a pest. Um, but... After they began shooting, I was invited to the set. And uh, I met Tom, and we, we talked about music and the, the idea for the source music, and that my song, Singular, was going to be the only original song in the picture. And it was going well, and I didn't even introduce myself to the actors. I stayed out, and I, I looked through the monitors, and it all started hitting me. And I said, I could write 10 of these. I could do this all day long. And Tom said, I could use one more. I said, I've already got it. And I left there now with a visual of what the two guys looked like. But again, didn't even want to break that plane and go and shake their hands and say, hi, my name is, and I'm going to... Just left. You know, I was smart enough to get up and leave. And I uh, went back east and wrote Runnin', thinking it was the second song. As people heard it, they said, we like this one even more. And I thought, wow, okay, and, you know, whatever it takes to make it work. But then... As the process went on, and they were so engaging, unlike an artist who, you know, you, you give them an end title track and it gets put in the picture, or if you're lucky, it gets somewhere in the body of the film. The specifics of writing it in this detail, compounded by this beautiful fact, I said, Fisher, if you'll allow me, I want to take a cut, and I want you, I want the editor, the temp music supervisor, and the scoring person to all be in the studio, and I'm going to sing it and play it to picture. Yeah. Because whatever vocal I may have delivered recording the record may not have fit the emotion of the scene right. and the breath so that it could be placed properly. So they all came over. And we recorded to picture 
and and edited the song accordingly so it would be able to fit. And then in turn, you know, I said, I really need the theme to recur in order to, to you know, enhance what it is that I'm trying to, to do here with the song. And again, Tom got involved at that point. He says, absolutely, I get it, I agree, I want this to happen. So running became an integral part of the movie and people, you know, got excited and Mr. Pacino writes me this letter and he said, it's the best movie song I've ever heard and it really makes the movie and it's pretty humbling, you know, this is this, it's Al Pacino. Suit up and they start going with the music. It's it's it all works. It, it worked, and just the idea that the, the collaborative effort was there, that they allowed me to pester them, to take them to a recording studio, you know, to go down. Even that, so now we did it. Pictures done, commitments are made. I've given them the songs. As you know, this isn't a big budget movie. It's a movie made from, out of passion and with passion. I then went to Nashville and made a record out of it and said, you got to put out a soundtrack. And they're like, you, know, you got a record deal. I'm like, I know, I'm giving you these songs in their entirety because now I've got the artistic part of me wants to share all six verses of these <laughs> long songs that don't get to be in the whole film. But I said, I'm, I'm representing these songs in their entirety. Do this, you know, let's go, let's go. So next week we're doing a video. I mean, you know, we're doing, everybody's committed. Everybody's committed. No, that's awesome. Well, the, the, the way I hope we can close is if I can just, the first thing that comes to your mind, just a very quickly, a few, few quick things. Um, Boobies. <laughs> <laughs> so, what? Uh, first of all, if someone could only hear one Bon Jovi song, what would you like it to be? I'd have to be living on a prayer. Living on a prayer. What song do you feel audiences connect with the most when you're up there on the stage looking out at them? There's, there's a half a dozen that are that high, but, you know, Living on a Prayer, Wanted Dead or Alive, It's My Life, uh, um, Who Says You Can't Go Home, you know, there's, there's a bunch of them now. What song of yours do you wish connected as Oh, I got 20 of those. There's 20 times when I've stood up and said, this is the one, folks, and... <laughs> It fails miserably. No, I, I've had 20 of those heartbreakers. You know, you don't understand. You Give Love a Bad Name is a number one song that I'm playing 30 years later. And there's a song called Welcome to Wherever You Are that was lyrically beautiful and didn't work. Or, you know, I've had a lot of those. <laughs> What's at the root of New Jersey's love affair with you and, and I imagine vice versa? What is at the core of that? You know, we've all had to live in New Jersey with... with the chip on our shoulder that we were in the shadow of New York, but we were able to develop who and what we were close enough to the center of the universe, but far enough away where nobody was really watching. And, and that, that, that makes or breaks who you're going to be um, because you're so close to the, to the center of the universe and yet you, know, you, you don't know if you can get in the ring or not. What is the, uh, what it, for, for somebody that, that would love to, for the millions that would love to follow in, in, in your footsteps, uh, what is the secret to longevity in this profession in which very few people find it the way that you have? I think it's, it's simple. Be true to who you are. Mm -hmm. don't, don't try to be something you're not. Don't play someone else's game because you'll always be a day late and a dollar short. And that's, that's the professional longevity. And the personal side of it, for you, as you mentioned, same, same wife. Still happy. Same band. Same, band. same record deal. What, you know, <laughs> we, we, we on the outside hear these, we see the, the stereotype or the cliche, you know, the, the almost famous or the, the where you see what life is like as a, as a star and the, all the temptation, all that. How have you managed to avoid it and stay uh, sane and normal over so long a time? I don't know that it's any secret, but it, the truth is, imagine the rest of the hard work and folks sit around their kitchen table who are sitting there watching these spoiled brats with everything handed to them and blowing it. And the guy's got to go to work and you know it's still dark outside and they're wondering about groceries on the table. They want to punch that little spoiled star right in the head. And so do I. So I just leave it at, I never want to get punched in the head. You know, that's, it's, it's as simple as that. You know, this isn't rocket science, what we do. We're entertainers. We're lucky to do what we do. And there's a lot of people working a lot harder. So don't blow it. If you had not wound up in music, what would you be doing today? Man, phew, there was no second choice, Scott. This was it. Well, we're, we're, we're lucky it worked out. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, buddy.